Assalamu alaikum khawateen huzrat. Wasim Asin welcomes you to the Virtual University of Pakistan. Marketing for non-profits is the course under study and the topic I'm going to touch upon today is structures of non-profit organizations and the salient features these structures carry with themselves. We all know that the structure of any organization stems basically from the purpose of the organization which means we have to understand first of all what the purpose is all about. The purpose of any organization underlines the need it satisfies of its target audience. That is the reason that structure of that organization stems from the purpose. While it fulfills the needs of its target audience, it has to develop certain interrelationships among its workers and reporting patterns among various levels of the organization and that is what we call structure. Structure therefore is an indication or a guide to whether or not an organization will be able to achieve its goals. Depending upon the purpose and the mission of the organization structure varies. It is very obvious. Depending upon the motives and objectives like I said the structure of an organization which is all about educate, educating people on health issues is going to be very different from the one which runs hospitals and dispensaries. Likewise, the structure of an organization which is all about saving the environment and improving ecology is going to be very different from the one which is going to be about human services. So this is the relationship between the purpose and the structure of an organization. However, there are uh, three very important constituents of uh, the structure of an NPO. And uh, these consist of uh, the clients. Clients basically are the target audience, the board of directors, and staff members. Let us take a look at these three constituents, the one by one. Who are clients? Well, like I said earlier, clients are your target audience. And your target audience could be the people who are uh, to be approached for uh, carrying out family planning uh, practices. Uh, then uh, clients could be those drivers who need to obey the traffic laws and clients could, could be those people who have uh, stakes in uh, not only the saving the environment but also those people who are required to take some action, a concrete action in order to save the environment. So all the people that uh, you have to approach in terms of changing their behavior to bring about a certain change to do certain good to the society is what you call target audience. Now this is very much against what you have in the uh, commercial markets. In commercial markets you have target audience who buy your products. Here in NPOs you have your target audience who are required to change their behavior in order to do something good to the society in terms of social welfare. So in other words, the actions which are required on part of those people who after taking the actions they will do some good to the society is all about the target audience of NPOs. The second constituent is the board of directors. Well, they are the people who initiate a certain cause and depending upon that cause, they come up with organizations. However small the organization may be at the beginning, but it is an effort which has to be carried out in an organized fashion and that is what gives their effort the shape of an organization. They are very important people because they are impassioned with the fulfillment of a certain cause and in doing so they have to develop the organization by employing staff members. Before I start talking about the staff members, a few more words about the importance of the members of the board. They are the people who basically are responsible for two important areas. The one is to serve the cause. 
which means that they have to be able to develop certain kind of a relationship with the working staff members uh, that they uh, are enabled to carry out the guidelines given by the board of directors. So in other words, the board of uh, directors have got to be very clear about uh, the policy guidelines which they give to their staff members. The other uh, prime objective of their job is to generate funds. Until they generate funds, NPOs they just cannot sustain themselves. If an NPO that happens to be kind of an NPO which uh, sells uh, products or services, it is a different matter altogether. But the fact is that uh, in order to uh, fulfill certain programs which take a lot of time um, uh, for uh, implementation, the board of directors could have got to be a very a keen observers of the whole effort that is undertaken by the staff members. So their role and uh, the NPOs can hardly be overemphasized. Now, this is not to say that uh, the board of uh, directors uh, they do not really carry importance when we talk about uh, the commercial organizations. What happens is that uh, in commercial organizations, uh, we have certain other success parameters uh, which uh, talk about uh, uh, performance of uh, the management. And the, the basic parameter of success is profitability. As long as uh, the companies are generating profits and uh, the posting uh, the good uh, the returns, um, everybody's happy and uh, the board of members have a very strong indication of an efficient and effective management. Now, this is not the case with uh, the NPOs because NPOs basically are all about fulfilling a certain cause and uh, in fulfilling uh, that uh, the particular cause they have to come up with a collection of programs and implementation of those prime pro programs could they take a long time and therefore uh, these uh, the members of the board have got to be very acute observers of the uh, development that takes place phase by phase and moment by moment now, this is not to say that they have to enroll themselves at every moment. All I'm saying is that uh, they've got to be um, aware of uh, the performance which is taking place within the organization. So from that standpoint, their role becomes extremely important. The third constituent is uh, the staff members. Okay, who are the staff members? Okay, well, just like uh, in commercial organizations, we have staff members okay, working for uh, the nonprofit organizations. However, in NPOs, the staff members could be paid staff members and they could also be volunteers. We have the volunteers from high schools and from colleges, especially in the developed world, working for NPOs. And the fact of the matter is that having served an NPO brings something very positive to the resumes of these youngsters. Um, the paid staff members are the ones who work full time, just like uh, we have staff members working for other organizations. The only thing is that uh, the relationship between the members of the board and the staff members has got to be such that staff members find themselves working in an enabling environment, trying to achieve all the results which are part of the motives and objectives of the NPO. And uh, this goes without saying that uh, the purpose and the mission of the organization explain all that. Whether it is an organization engaged in uh, um, running dispensaries or hospitals, or it is creating awareness about family planning or deadly diseases like HIV, AIDS, etc., etc., um, staff members have got to be uh, very um, highly aware of the kind of programs they are supposed to carry out. Now, in order to um, rub in the importance of the uh, quality of relationship between members of the board and the staff, let me take you to the certain graphics which is going to make it amply uh, clear what um, is the kind of relationship I'm talking about. Uh, this is um, a slide which shows you the nature of relationships and this actually summarizes all the three the points the which I uh, talked about. Uh, number one is the purpose and mission of the organization. Now, this is something which uh, is um, in the domain of uh, the board of directors. The second nature of uh, the job is uh, uh, developing and maintaining good relationship with the staff members. And uh, this, of course, is required of uh, the, the board of directors. 
Number three uh, thing which I talked about is the implementation of programs. So this is kind of a sequence of uh, the activities which take place in an uh, organization, I mean a non-profit organization starting with purpose and mission and ending at the implementation of program. The importance of programs and uh, the amount of time they might take uh, for the implementation are the kind of things which I have been rubbing in uh, all along my teaching. Now, in order to make it further clear as to how the role of for the board of directors uh, can really make the overall working of an NPO more effective, let me take you to yet another graphic. If we take uh, the good look uh, at this slide, uh, we see that this is kind of uh, a repetition of uh, the one we saw earlier. Uh, I mean the, the middle part of the graphic, and we have those three areas, purpose and mission, then working by staff, and uh, implementation of programs. The importance of uh, these um, activities is uh, accentuated by uh, exhibiting the relationship which board members will have and do have with people working for NPOs. First of all, the members of the board have got to have a very clear vision of the purpose and the mission of the organization. And like I said earlier, these are the kind of things which emanate basically from the motive of the organization. And we know the motive is something which the people um, with uh, a noble cause harbor all the time and they are um, impassioned to take that to the logical conclusion. Uh, so in other words, the, what I'm saying is uh, the board members where the clarity of vision can and rather should uh, come up with a very clear purpose and mission for the organization so that the staff members can uh, with, with uh, full commitment and dedication execute all that which has been laid down as policy guidelines by the members of the board. The next level uh, or the area where uh, importance of uh, members of the board really that comes in is the maintenance of good relationship with the staff members. And this is something which uh, I touched upon earlier. Uh, if they have a uh, the good relationship with staff members, staff members will be in a position to translate all those uh, policy guidelines into actionable programs and come up with good results. Now, this uh, takes it for granted that staff members are able people and they have basic uh, uh, competencies, I mean core competencies, in order to carry out all those programs uh, which have been um, put together by them as a translation of the purpose and mission of the organization as enunciated by the members of the board. The third area where the members of the board really have to play a very important role is the monitoring and control. Now, this is not to say that monitoring does not take place in commercial organizations. All I'm saying is that in NPOs, this area takes on added importance. Why do they have to monitor the progress all the time because of the nature of the programs. They are not selling uh, tangible products. Uh, also, they're not uh, the selling services in most of the cases. And therefore, uh, the programs which have been put together for things which are going to take a lot of time for implementation, uh, involvement, and dedication of members of the board is of very high importance. And that is why they have to monitor the whole thing over and over again. It is uh, something which uh, just cannot be ignored. And uh, if uh, they really can uh, monitor uh, the working of the staff members in a way that staff members feel motivated by the working for those directors, then the overall result of um, the whole effort, as you can see from the graphic, is good governance. So to summarize, we can say that good governance is a function of uh, the very clear and effective policy guidelines given by the members of the board, plus ability of the management of the NPO to carry out all the programs which are a reflection or a translation of those policy guidelines. Let us now conclude uh, this uh, topic. We can uh, summarize the whole thing like the following. 
Number one is that uh, the structure of an organization is a function of uh, the purpose and mission of the organization. And uh, the purpose and mission basically stem from the motives and objectives of uh, the people who start uh, that particular or any particular NPO. Number two is that uh, the structure of an NPO consists of three the basic components. Number one is the target audience, okay, who are known as clients in NPO terminology. And number two component is um, the board of directors. And number three is the staff members. The, the board of directors could play a very important role uh, toward the overall working of the, the NPO. Now, this is not to say that uh, the staff members uh, are, are, are the ones who play a secondary role. They also play a primary role. The only thing is that there's got to be a tremendous coordination and understanding, clarity and transparency between the working of the board of directors and staff members. However, uh, directors of, of the board um, take uh, added importance in NPOs because they are the initiators of the cause and they are the ones responsible for implementation of the programs and they are the ones responsible to generate funds in order to sustain the organization. Therefore, they are the people who've got to be very astute visionaries so that they can lay down very clear policy guidelines. And the management, management of course, um, has got to be um, good, uh, a team of good workers who really can translate those uh, uh, the visionary guidelines into good, actionable programs. One more thing about the, the board of directors is that, uh, that they've got to be people of undisputable and unquestionable integrity. There should be no conflict of interest. Conflict of interest has been defined as interest on part of the, the board of directors, meaning personal or vested interest on part of the board of directors, which they might place before the interest of the organization. And that is where the organizational interests are compromised. There should be no compromise and there should be no conflict of interest. So this is the conclusion of the topic that I've discussed. And it has been about the structure of an organization uh, in the nonprofit area and its salient features. With this conclusion, let us now move on to the next topic, which is about the need for marketing in the nonprofit area. The related questions that we may think to ourselves or ask ourselves are, why is there a need for marketing in an NPO? And the second question is, uh, who is supposed to understand and appreciate the importance of the application of marketing principles in NPOs? Uh, just the managers working for NPOs or also some other people? The answer to this question has got to be found out and it is going to be found out in connection with the relevant discussion which I'm going to give you as part of the importance of marketing. We all know that the marketing basically is a behavior change or behavior influence game. We carry out the marketing practice in order to change the behavior of our target audience in order for them to buy more and more of our products or services. We want them to prefer our products over competition. Come to us, buy our product, become loyal to our company. And same is the case with NPOs. But before I start talking about the NPOs, let me give you a very the brief description of the kind of marketing practice carried out in commercial organizations for the sake of consistency and drawing the relationship between that practice and the one we have or should have for NPOs. We all know that the marketing practice starts with the internal marketing in commercial organizations for the simple reason that uh, the marketing people have to take along with them everybody uh, who has stakes in the launch, introduction, or the maintenance of a certain product. They have to convince members of the board, um, equity holders, um, top management, and uh, the trade members, meaning all those who have stakes uh, you know, in the company and the product um, in focus. After they have carried out this job of internal marketing, the meaning they have uh, sold the idea of uh, the application of uh, the marketing um, as they envisage, they get on to the next phase of marketing, which is external marketing. External marketing is where actual behavior inference game amply manifests itself. Uh, because it is where uh, we see the application of uh, the principle of marketing in the form of um, variables of marketing mix. The variables are 
at play uh, at this juncture uh, because uh, we have the product, we have priced it, we have distributed it and we are carrying out promotions. All these uh, manifestations influence the target audience either to buy your product or not to buy your product and uh, why they may not buy your product is beyond the scope of this discussion at the moment. But the point is that uh, the basic two areas uh, where managers are engaged in a commercial organization are internal marketing and external marketing. As a result of external marketing, if they are in a position to do a lot of sales and bring in profitability to the company, that is the end of the story. End of the story in a way that that becomes an iterative process and it goes over and over again. Everybody's happy, satisfied with the profitability and all that. Profitability being the prime success measure or parameters um, within any um, commercial organization. Given all that, we can easily say that the application of the principles of marketing in a non-profit context is at least as important, if not more. The fact is that it is even more important because changing of behaviors within a non-profit uh, environment is even more challenging than it is in commercial organizations or in a commercial setup. For the simple reason that uh, the behavior change game is a little more complex when it comes to nonprofits. Why? Because we are dealing with programs, I mean the kind of programs that I've been talking about. We are trying to change behavior of people in order to change their actions into becoming either better citizens or into the becoming kind of citizens who will take actions toward the end that we have envisaged in order for the society to become a better place. So this is the difference between a commercial enterprise and a non-profit enterprise. The application of marketing is as important as it is on the commercial side, but the only difference is, and which is the big difference, that on the non-profit side, the application of marketing is a little more complex because of a stew of complex variables involved in implementation of different kinds of varied programs. Now, having said uh, all that, uh, there is a need on part of not just the, the managers the working for the nonprofit organizations, but all those people who are involved with the nonprofit sectors. In other words, which means that the marketing managers of nonprofits have to influence uh, not just uh, the equity holders and uh, the other stakeholders in a commercial enterprise, they have to influence donors, funders, government, government agencies, and all those stakeholders who have stakes in the outcome of uh, the mission an NPO has undertaken for fulfillment. Dealing with the question of uh, who else should uh, really understand and appreciate the importance of application of marketing principles in addition to managers working for the NPOs, I can say with a lot of confidence that uh, owing to the growth of uh, the nonprofit organizations, they have to deal with uh, so many government agencies and the corporate sector that people within the government and the corporate sector have got to understand and appreciate the challenges of the nonprofit enterprise and therefore need to have a thorough grounding in the principles of marketing. It's not only NPO managers who have got to have a complete understanding as to how to influence the donors and the government agencies, that is a very important marketing job. The personnel could also have to have a complete understanding of the application of marketing as it works in the non-profit environment. Similarly, the managers on the, the corporate side who are associated with the, non, with the non-profit sector, um, about which I'm going to talk about in detail in one of the, the coming lectures, also need to have a complete understanding of the dynamics of uh, the non-profit uh, environment in order to be able to contribute more effectively and efficiently toward the cause they have collaborated on with the nonprofit organization. Uh, what is happening is that uh, the nonprofit organizations are uh, getting into uh, collaborations with the government agencies and also with the corporate sector. And in that context, it becomes very important for all the people working for all the three sectors to have a good understanding of the principles of marketing so that they can understand each other each other's language and so that they can contribute toward 
the goals of the non-profit organization in particular toward fulfillment of its particular cause. Let me show you this thing with the help of graphic. As you can see uh, from this uh, particular slide that uh, we have two areas. The one is commercial marketing and the other is non-profit marketing. In commercial marketing, you see just two aspects. The one is internal marketing and the other is external marketing. Now, these are the two aspects I talked about in detail. If you take a look at non-profit marketing, you see three circles indicating internal marketing, external funders, and external targets. Now, the question is, who are external funders and who are external targets? One thing which is very obvious from these two uh, competitive diagrams that uh, there's more work to do in the nonprofit area okay, because uh, nonprofit uh, the marketing deals with okay, the more sub areas than commercial marketing does. Nonprofit okay, the marketing people have to do with external funders okay, because they have to generate funds. Although okay, it is uh, one of the prime responsibilities of the board of directors, but board members okay, may also and do uh, mostly involve effective managers within the organizations to help them toward generation of those funds through external funders. And who could be the external funders? I did talk about that in detail earlier. And I'll be touching upon this area in detail in one of the subsequent lectures. The third area which the nonprofit marketing people deal with is the external targets. So it is the clients or the, the target audience could wish to deal with. And uh, that also uh, needs no uh, further elaboration. Uh, the fact remains that uh, the area of nonprofit marketing is a little more complex and a little more elaborate, I would say, in terms of the efforts they have to carry out to fulfill their mission. And uh, with this, I conclude uh, this um, topic by giving you a, a little summary and uh, that is going to make uh, the whole thing even more clear and uh, the free of any confusion. It is much less difficult in a commercial enterprise to have uh, your target audience change their behavior uh, in preference of your brand. It is not that easy in a nonprofit context to change the behavior of your target audience. Why? because it is a lot more complex to have your target audience change their behavior in terms of maintaining certain spacing between children as part of the family planning effort. Or in order to have your target audience change their behavior in terms of the vaccinating or having their babies vaccinated for diarrhea. Now, these examples clarify why it is a lot more complex effort on part of the nonprofit marketing managers um, to carry out uh, their uh, the marketing, marketing programs in comparison with uh, the commercial marketers. And this brings into a sharp focus the central role of the application of marketing principles in the nonprofit area. Because marketing remains the behavior influencer or the behavior change game. With this, let's now move on to the next topic, which is about the evolution of the uh, nonprofit sector. The, the question here is, how did the evolution of nonprofits take place? People have been helping each other for times immemorial. The fact is that uh, the humans have been helping each other generally and in times of distress particularly. They have been forming small bodies within communities on self-help and self-sustaining basis for the reasons uh, I've been talking about. And uh, in order to help each other, these uh, the bodies uh, grew you know, from time to time and uh, they have taken the shape of NPOs the way they present themselves today. It's been uh, a long journey, but uh, the fact is that uh, all along uh, the evolution of uh, these bodies which now have come to be known as non-profit organizations there is the one thing which has been consistently presenting itself and that is doing something good to the society helping others helping others from the standpoint of bringing about an improvement in social 
welfare. According to experts, there are three stages to this circuit evolution. The first one is known as the voluntary stage. This also is known as the civic model. The second one is a philanthropic stage, uh, whereas the third one is the, the market or the competitive stage. Let us talk about these together one by one. The voluntary stage is the oldest stage of uh, the evolution, and uh, that is the one which I referred to when I was talking about small bodies on self-help and self-sustaining basis. Actually, the help was offered in those areas which were neglected by the governments. The fact is that even today, uh, there are certain areas uh, which are neglected by the governments and uh, we as uh, the non-profit managers uh, do jump into the vacuum for improving social welfare. However, uh, what really strengthened the initiative uh, taken by people uh, during that period or those times uh, was the religious values. The prime motivators uh, were altruism and generosity. Along with uh, the religious values, uh, the social values also came into play uh, because what happens is uh, that when we operate in a society on a day-to-day -day basis, we just cannot ignore the sociological factors. And in came the inevitable uh, side of the sociological factors and on the basis of shared values, uh, the people started giving refinements to the associations or the bodies uh, which they had developed. So in other words, what I'm saying is that not only on the religious spaces, but also on the lines of ethnicity and on the lines of okay, the shared values, the people from within the same religion came up with okay, associations okay, within their own communities or within their own ethnic setups. And the result was okay, the further distinctions and refinements to the associations or the bodies okay, which they had formed okay, toward improvement of social okay, the welfare. Uh, it is generally said uh, by sociologists that uh, the shared values uh, become a very strong bond and they lead toward complete cohesiveness and homogeneity. Uh, cohesiveness, in other words, is a function of shared values. And when you share certain values within the same religion, your bond gets further strengthened. We can take the example of uh, the community that works um, on self-help basis and uh, undertakes performing of all the final rites and rituals uh, at the time of death of a person within the community. Why do they do that? Because the religious values along with uh, uh, sociological factors uh, come into play and uh, they become the basic motivators uh, for rendering of the service. Uh, we have uh, these kind of associations in our society as well. And uh, the example that I have given you is an example from uh, within our uh, own society. So uh, what happens is uh, the people start these kind of associations uh, on ethnic basis and uh, they become big and then bigger and at times they also uh, cross the, uh, the ethnic lines and uh, they become even bigger to serve other uh, ethnic groups and uh, they become huge organizations. The question arises, why do they form these associations on ethnic lines? And the answer lies in uh, having easy access to the resources of one ethnic group. I think it goes without saying that when you are one ethnic group and share uh, so many different socio-cultural values and uh, also uh, are part of the same religion, uh, you are more cohesive and you are more homogenized. And you have access to resources and uh, the developing and sustaining the organization becomes less challenging than it could have been otherwise. However, in the process, you become big and cross the ethnic boundaries into bigger organizations. Let's now talk about the next stage, which is the philanthropic stage. As a result of the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of wealth among certain individuals and families in the industrialized world. And what happened was there was a sense of uh, renewed the social responsibility. The people who were wealthy wanted to help others. And they started forming and founding foundations which oversaw the working of the associations or the kind of associations which I was talking about in relation to the earlier stage. These foundations came up and started helping people in ways much bigger than the people helped each other in the previous stage. The fact is that we may not have a lot of the foundations in our country but there is um, a, a tremendous 
uh, the growth of uh, the individuals and families who do not really hesitate uh, donating uh, the huge sums for social welfare causes. Although there was more money in the hands of uh, the wealthy people who wanted to help others toward uh, the improvement of social welfare, uh, but the fact remains that uh, the motivators behind uh, that spirit were the same as uh, the we witnessed in the first evolutionary stage or the, uh, the voluntary stage. And those were religious values and uh, the social responsibility. However, the one expert uh, adds to these two uh, the motivators another factor uh, which is uh, the factor of market failure. It sounds uh, very interesting and the expert expounds that uh, the uh, markets are uh, regulated by the forces of supply and demand and hence determine pricing by the interplay of these forces. So uh, what happens is uh, because of high prices of uh, good quality or high quality services the underprivileged cannot enjoy those services because they are not available to them um, for the paucity of funds. They do not have enough money to pay for those services and therefore there's a vacuum. And that is why this expert calls it the market failure factor. The uh, fact remains that uh, the vacuum is uh, filled by non-profit organizations. And uh, we see so many different examples in the areas of education, uh, health, and human services. Uh, we have good universities uh, that are doing an excellent job of uh, providing good education. And uh, we have good health services providing different uh, kinds of uh, treatments for different kinds of ailments. So may that be in the area of cancer, in the area of eye treatment, or in the area of kidney treatment. Uh, we do have all these services available within our country. If you uh, run your mind toward what I'm indicating, you will know what I'm talking about. So the uh, fact remains that uh, we have also uh, the people who liberally and very generously uh, donate uh, toward these kinds of uh, the causes and uh, exhibit uh, the philanthropy on their part. The third stage is uh, known as the, the market stage or the competitive stage, and that is the stage that we find NPOs uh, today. At this juncture, they are beyond the stages of associations and foundations, and they find themselves in a very competitive situation. Why? Because of the fact that there are so many NPOs. The growth dynamics of NPOs necessitate that they take a very close look at the application of marketing principles and try to deal with the kind of competitive pressures they find themselves under. What are the competitive pressures and why do they occur? Well, the competitive pressures occur because of the fact that uh, we have so many NPOs working for the same cause or for similar causes. And because of that reason, the funders and donors could find themselves in a difficult situation deciding who to donate and who not to donate. And this is here that the importance of application of marketing principles to win over those funders and donors it becomes extremely important. This competitiveness gives uh, the marketing a very central role and it is because of the application of uh, the marketing principles that uh, we see so many NPOs in the Western markets getting into commercial activities. And uh, the, like I indicated earlier, the hospitals uh, are seen getting into um, fitness centers where they generate funds. And by the same token, the museums are seen getting into uh, the managing shops where they sell artwork. And the universities are seen getting into alliances with research companies in order to generate funds. These developments are not without criticism. Uh, critics say that, uh, that this amounts to going overboard and uh, that this is too much of uh, the commercialism. However, NPOs could also have uh, the proponents who say that uh, there is nothing wrong in going for this kind of commercialism as long as uh, the money generated is kept back within the NPOs. In other words, if the NPOs remain within the charter of uh, not distributing that money and rather keeping it back to themselves to bring in more vitality into the future programs, there is nothing wrong in getting into the commercial activities. So this is the kind of situation and NPOs could find themselves today. Having talked about uh, all these uh, stages, I should now move on to giving you the 
conclusion of uh, all these stages. Uh, the one consistent linkage that we have uh, seen all along these three stages is the willingness to work for others and uh, the willingness to improve social welfare. And uh, for that, uh, we've been having uh, the different kind of associations and then organizations uh, meant to uh, improve uh, the lot of people. And uh, we have seen that uh, generation of funds uh, also uh, has been a consistent activity uh, among uh, the associations first and then the organizations in the later uh, the part of the evolutionary stages uh, because uh, without generating funds, uh, NPOs uh, just cannot sustain themselves uh, for a long time to come. Actually, the conclusion is that uh, the NPOs uh, should generate funds to the point uh, where they do not really have to uh, spend a lot of time in generating funds through others unless they are into kind of uh, the marketing uh, which is all about uh, the intangible programs uh, where they cannot sell anything and uh, they have to uh, depend upon donors and funders NPOs uh, should carry out uh, some kind of commercial activity uh, which gives them uh, uh, a a reason and um, a platform to generate their own funds. With this, uh, let us now move on to the next topic, which is about the influencers of NPOs emergence. Meaning that we have uh, learned the evolutionary stages of NPOs, but we also have to look at uh, those factors uh, which really influenced their emergence. And uh, in trying to uh, learn that, uh, the one question which comes to our mind is, what really are those influencers? Well, the answer lies in the three different influencers. Uh, the first one is uh, the social marketing. The second one is the, the international dimension. And the third one is uh, what we call the involvement of the corporate sector. Let us uh, briefly talk about uh, all these factors in order to have a clear understanding of this, uh, the basic aspect of NPOs as well. Well, the social marketing is uh, all about uh, serving social causes. And the fact is that if we take a good look at the evolution of NPOs, which I just talked about, we will see a consistent linkage of the willingness to work for others. And uh, this is what we may call social marketing because social marketing is all about uh, serving uh, the society, you know, doing something good for the social welfare of people within the communities and within the society. And that is why it is known as social marketing. The fact is that uh, the concept of social marketing is not very old. Uh, it is just about two decades old and therefore it is a new area of study and uh, it needs to be understood in uh, the total clarity. This also is an area which I'm going to talk about in detail in one of the subsequent lectures. But here I will touch upon this as one of the subsets of the nonprofit sector or nonprofit marketing. Here, an important distinction has to be made between the social marketing and social media marketing. Social media marketing is a new terminology which is very popular among uh, the young people like yourselves and uh, the fact is that uh, the social media marketing is miles and miles away from social marketing. Although uh, it is uh, beyond the scope of uh, the discussion uh, at hand, uh, but to have a complete understanding and to keep any confusion from arising, we must know uh, what social media marketing is all about. It goes uh, beyond the traditional tools of advertising, promotions and public relations into the web-based internet tools like Facebook, Twitter, and blogs, etc. Uh, social media marketing basically offers uh, the sellers and buyers to interact with each other, making uh, the communications two-way as against a one-way process uh, in the traditional way. Uh, we know when we carry out traditional uh, the marketing, uh, we communicate with uh, our buyers uh, in a, in a one-way process. Uh, when we advertise uh, in papers or uh, we uh, run uh, television commercials, it is a one-way communication process. There is no way that uh, our customers or consumers uh, you know, can get back to us immediately uh, telling us uh, about uh, the way they think about our products and services. Social media marketing has made it possible to have uh, the two-way communication between buyers and sellers. Uh, the buyers can give uh, their insights to sellers to bring about improvements in their products or they may 
appreciate the products so that they can reinforce the um, features of the products and uh, buyers can also criticize uh, their products uh, for uh, the sellers to take corrective actions. So this is the importance of uh, the social media uh, the marketing. Um, in social media marketing, you also have a chance to uh, develop uh, the social communities and through those social communities, you can talk about a certain brand. You can promote a brand or you really can run a brand down if you think that the brand is not good enough. So the social media marketing has its own importance, but it remains a part of the integrated marketing communications and therefore it is not to be confused with social marketing. Social marketing is all about social welfare programs. This is something that we have to keep in mind. Social marketing is all about bringing about a behavior change in our target audience to achieve certain objectives in relation to social welfare. This is a huge difference between social marketing and the social media marketing. If we take a good look at uh, the world-renowned uh, social marketing programs, uh, we shall see uh, the one commonality of purpose, uh, whether the program is about uh, creating awareness uh, on family planning or against uh, the deadly disease of uh, the HIV AIDS or um, educating uh, the simple uh, the village folks about how to rightly uh, administer uh, the ORT, uh, the dosage uh, to their uh, the babies. Uh, there is one thing common that social marketing programs strive to bring about a change of behavior in the target audience. Um, and therefore, uh, it is uh, very, very different and miles and miles away uh, from social media marketing. Uh, because of uh, these uh, the features, uh, the social marketing really uh, makes uh, the use of uh, the concepts of marketing in order to uh, make the programs successful. The second um, influencer of uh, the emergence of NPOs is uh, the international dimension. Uh, the fact is that uh, internationally there has been a diminishing support for NPOs uh, for reasons more than one. Governments have been cutting back their funding to the NPOs and even international agencies have been revising their programs when it comes to providing support to NPOs all over the world. However, international agencies do support some causes which are international in nature. In other words, if they are supporting one cause in one country, they do not seemingly have reason not to support the same cause in another country. But generally, the support has been diminishing. So what is the result? The result is a vacuum and that vacuum is being filled by NPOs. Because of the growth of NPOs, the environment, as I talked earlier, is becoming more and more competitive. And because of the diminishing support from the governments and international agencies, more and more NPOs are coming up to fill the vacuum. And therefore, the importance of application of marketing just cannot be ruled out. Marketing does take the central role in order to make the programs successful. The third influencer has been the involvement of the corporate sector. Just because of the reasons that I've talked about, the meaning diminishing support from the government and international agencies, NPOs started approaching the corporate sector. And the corporate sector found it very appropriate and compatible with part of the mission, which is to be socially responsible. Actually, when corporate sector joins, hands with NPOs, they look more socially responsible because they uh, look like serving a certain cause. Uh, the result is that uh, their staff members get to start feeling more motivated and uh, they also get to do some kind of uh, the volunteering work for the NPOs and in the process uh, they improve earnings uh, for their uh, the corporations. The NPOs uh, get to also gain uh, by way of uh, the getting part of the uh, the contribution uh, from sales proceeds of the, uh, the corporation uh, which is engaged with the NPO to uh, the fulfill a certain cause. So the fact is that uh, the, it works uh, the both ways. Uh, the both stand to gain and uh, the, therefore the corporate sector also has been uh, the one of the um, great influencers uh, of uh, the emergence uh, of uh, the NPOs. Not only emergence of NPOs uh, but strengthening of uh, the NPOs uh, uh, the working. We can uh, con conclude this uh, the topic like the following. Uh, growth of NPOs has taken place with every increment of the influencers. 
And owing to the challenges, uh, the NPOs have learned to work in a coordinative and collaborative way with the governmental and international aid agencies. The, the intergovernmental and interagency interactions have added a new dimension to the, the working of the NPOs. And similarly, the, the working of uh, the corporate sector alongside the, way the NPOs has also added a new facet to the working of uh, the NPOs. Uh, the fact is that uh, the uh, NPO sector gains financially and uh, the corporate sector fulfills its many strategic needs through this engagement with the non-profit sector. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and look forward to talking with you in the next lecture. Thank you very much.